both St. Craig's I water and and you see experienced guys flying and the fuselage is almost always level and then the cells are moving and the helicopter or the B-22 is, is moving around with a level level attitude. A bunch of new test pilots trying to figure out how to handle this this airframe was uh, was interesting. Uh, we were always chasing ourselves because of the cell motion. Uh, it was doing things to us that were unexpected because you had no seat of the pants feedback. And the tilt rotor you know, is a quantum leap over any helicopter, and they can do things that you know, we've never thought of. Well. The B-22 program was very interesting. I was very interested in uh, what became the B-22 years and years before uh, it was called the V-22. We were interested in vectored thrust and while I was in test pilot school I did some projects on vectored thrust and of course the Harrier was flying at that time and there were Bell Helicopter and uh, Boeing had done some work on very early models of uh, prototypes using a tilt rotor and there were tilted fans and various different concepts. Anyway, during the test pilot school we did a study, uh, purely a bunch of students and a couple instructors of what, what's the benefit of this and what is the best kind of design you want to move. Uh, a lot of air at a slow speed, which would be helicopter vectored thrust, or a little bit of air at a very high speed, and that would be a jet engine vectored thrust like the Harrier. So, considering the weight, costs, engineering issues, uh, we came up with that uh, a tiltable rotor system was the best, best way to go. And at that time the XV-15 was flying and that was a Bell Helicopter Army NASA joint effort. So we thought that that was the logical thing to do. So we got in, in HMX we saw the potential that maybe this was the right thing to do because in HMX we were looking at the, the X part of uh, Marine Corps helicopter work and then we were also looking at the potential for a tilt rotor in the presidential mission because a tilt rotor in the presidential mission would offer speed which was really important uh, especially during the Cold War scenario and we were in a Cold War scenario during the Reagan administration of how to quickly get the president out of town and that was uh, very very important to survivability of the presidency, which was the mission underneath uh, presidential transportation. Because presidential transportation was just a safety thing for carrying the president back and forth. Maintaining the presidency with the uh, escape scenarios was one of the more important things that we had to do. Luckily, we've never had to execute that mission. Anyway, we said that tilt rotor would be a logical progression in helicopter aviation. So uh, we wrote the requirement for a tilt rotor to be in that mission. And just about that time, uh, uh, in the late or in the early 80s, the concept of accepting or defining what the next uh, helicopter would be and everybody started leaning toward the tilt rotor for its speed and range. And they made the right decision to go with the V-22 kind of design with a tiltable rotor because it moves a large quantity of air and uh, it can fly like an airplane or hover and do the helicopter mission plus do the transport mission and carry people a long ways at a, at a pretty high speed cruising up 280, 300 knots, so uh, very, very efficient. So we, we 
got into that and then about that time I was finishing up my career at HMX and I said, you know, I want to be involved in this. And that's that was a decision I made to go to the B-22 program at Bell Helicopter. Uh, both Bell and Boeing were um, involved in the program. They had won the contract to build the B-22. So that was where I was going to go. Luckily, uh, my family decided that Texas was a better environment for us instead of going to, to the Philadelphia region since we're uh, more the West Coast type family. And uh, luckily, Bell had an offer for me, and I was on my way to Bell Helicopter as a test pilot on the B 22. Well, not everything works out really well. Like the second week I was here, and uh, my Bell job, uh, Dick Cheney came about as the Secretary of Defense and canceled the V-22 program. And of course my wife uh, heard that on the news and then when I got home that night she says, well, Smarty, uh, <laughs> that was a great decision. We gave up, uh, you know, the National War College to get out of the military and go to Bell Helicopter and now They've canceled your program and, you know, you know, well, what are you going to do now? Well, it's very, very interesting how, you know, the Marine Corps made a decision and they stuck with it. Really? The Marines constantly supported the V-22. Uh, Dick Cheney and a lot of people in, in the Congress and a lot of people in the Department of Defense and a lot of technology gurus around the uh, United States all said that the V-22 was a bad decision, too costly, too expensive, too much technical difficulty, and uh, it was not the right, right vehicle. Well, the Marines stuck with it, and there's a group of people in the Marine Corps and a group of people who always believed in the Marines, and uh, we rode that train all the way through and wow. it made it. But it was only through the determination of people like General P.X. Kelly, General Dake, uh, uh, General Blott, the people who really had the vision that this was the right airframe and this was the right conceptual design. So I was, uh, you know, slugging away day after day working on the V-22 and you know we had our successes and failures and we had a had a terrible contract it was a fixed price contract for a development program so you know if if something didn't work it was fixed priced and we were we were on the contractually obligated to develop the program no matter what it cost and wow we got our money and so we had to produce had to build six prototypes and actually only five ever flew the sixth one never never made it and it was uh, why is that it was well why because uh, there were a lot of delays there were part shortages many 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 changes that came about and just just became too prohibitively expensive. Was it built and never flown? Or? It was built and never flown. Okay. And uh, used for many, many other purposes uh, for lab tests, ground tests, lots of things. But in, in the research and development arena, trying to build a new product on a fixed price contract was not, not the way to go. Anyway, right. it's, it's not an excuse, but the uh, that's, that's where we were. Well, the uh, starting off on the V-22 program at Bell Helicopter was, was really interesting because I was always used to being broad brush looking at a lot of different programs because of my luck to have the kind of job I did in the Marine Corps. But I came to Bell Helicopter, I was really focused on, on one thing and that was just V-22 specifically, it was my first real assignment was to work in the computer simulation. Uh, we had a 
a preliminary model of a tilt rotor in the simulator, but we didn't have a V22 cockpit. We had a very generic kind of cockpit that was just an engineering uh, simulator. So I got, got involved in that, and then I said, well, what can I do about simulators? So I went up to American Airlines and started flying with them in uh, 767, 757 cockpits because they were glass cockpit, uh, like the V-22. The V-22 is going to be all glass cockpit, fly-by-wire. Uh, was it that way originally, or did it start out with gauges? No, it's always, really? always a glass cockpit. Okay. Uh, and you know, we heard stories about the transition from round gauge cockpits to glass cockpits and the crew coordination required to, to make that work. And in the V-22, it's just basically two pilots. Crew chief is kind of out of the picture due to the design of the cockpit environment. He can't do much up there. He can't assist with too many uh, actions other than maybe lowering the landing gear, but that, <laughs> it's pretty simple stuff. Uh, <laughs> we needed some help. So American Airlines was a great place to go, and they gave us a lot of help in how to work together in the glass cockpit environment. Because helicopter guys in the Marine Corps and the Navy and they were, had not flown any glass cockpits at all, unless they were lucky enough to be in a test pilot program and flying glass cockpits and other airplanes. So we were well on our way then, uh, got some ideas about how to do that, and that was, that was fun. And we kind of developed the, what we needed in the, in the cockpit environment. A bunch of new test pilots trying to figure out how to handle this, this airframe was, uh, was interesting. Uh, you know, a lot of the test pilots were company test pilots who had been there for years and years. <clears throat> and then there were a mixture of us newly retired or military test pilots. And this was a, a joint program, so we had current military pilots with us in the, in the test program. <clears throat> and we were doing simulations and playing what-if games and trying to define how the what we wanted in the cockpit. And one of the biggest questions was the size of the nacelle indicator gauge, the gauge that would tell us uh, where the nacelles were positioned, whether they were 30 degrees forward, 45 degrees forward, or all the way on the downstops in airplane mode. And, and this helicopter, or the tilt rotor, has the potential of moving the nacelles aft a few degrees, which is yeah kind of a really handy thing to have for maneuvering or ground taxiing or uh, making a very steep, slow approach. You can put the nacelles aft and almost hang on the nacelles with the nose down. It would be a great view of the terrain as you, <laughs> as you make your approach, but it very So we said, well, what, how big is this going to be, you know, uh, how, how much real estate is it going to take up on the multifunction display? A lot of people were thinking, well, this is so important, maybe we need to have a separate gauge just totally for the nacelles. And uh, the engineer said, no, uh, we're not going to put another gauge in the cockpit. We're going to just, it's going to be on the multifunction display. And then, so a uh, debate went on for a long, long time. And flying the simulator, uh, you don't get the tactile feedback in the simulator as you do in an airplane or a helicopter from control responses, so we, we didn't, didn't know. We, we were always chasing ourselves because of the cell motion. Uh, it was doing things to us that were unexpected because he had no seat of the pants feedback. Mm. Well, after the first couple flights, it was unanimous to everybody that we didn't need any stinking nacelle gauge anymore, anywhere. Really? Because <laughs> when those nacelles move, you get such a tremendous positive feedback as to where they are and which direction you moved them, even if you move them just a degree or two. Really? Yeah, very, very positive, very responsive. Tremendous amount of thrust and it gives you very solid feedback.
feedback. So I remember you telling me that when you moved the nacelles to forward flight and pushed the throttles forward, that even from jets that you've flown, that it accelerated quicker yes. than those. Yes. Wow. Yeah. If you were lightweight and you moved those nacelles forward at a high power setting, you were, you were going along for the ride. It would really throw you back in the seat. It was very, very thrilling. And as a helicopter guy, you know, I've flown a little bit of fixed wing and different jets with afterburner and stuff. And this was uh, the biggest thrill I'd ever experienced was moving those nacelles forward. As a helicopter guy, I said, boy, we should have been doing this for the last hundred years. <laughs> this was wonderful. Uh, because, you know, you, you just, you're using that thrust very, very efficiently. And it was really exciting. And, and as that people got more and more comfortable with the, the tilt rotor and we were flying it, uh, we just, everybody loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was uh, a real dream to fly for a helicopter guy. And then the fixed wing guys uh, who had extensive fixed wing background we were always impressed with the fact that they could come in and land in small zones and do uh, helicopter things relatively easily. And uh, that proved that the background for pilots wasn't a big deal. We always thought that helicopter pilots would be the best tilt rotor pilots, but uh, we've had very, very successful fixed wing transitions. Guys come with a predominant uh, fixed wing background and then we give them a short course in flying helicopters and hovering. And it really boiled down to the air sense. You know, there's, there's guys that have the hands and have the ability to fly and uh, you know, they could fly a garbage truck if you could figure out how to get it <laughs> airborne. And the tilt rotor uh, was a pretty easy uh, machine to fly. In fact, when we were flying the first uh, B-22s in the development program, we did not have any automatic flight control systems working on the airplane. It was pretty much flying a bare bones uh, really? machine without any automatic stabilization. Uh, and it was very stable. Uh, you know, you couldn't fly it hands off, but you could, you know, do all of your tasks and be very proficient at it. Oh, I was gonna ask you that if, you know, with some fixed wing, you know, I, don't, I have more knowledge about fixed wing than rotors, but with some, some fixed wing airplanes, depending on the stability of the aerodynamics, you, you can, in certain conditions, trim it up and it'll, track straight ahead. V-22 yeah. wasn't like that at all? Well, we didn't have that those trim features operating. Oh, at the time. Oh, oh, at the time. Yeah. Okay. So it, it was all hands-on, but it was very, very stable. And like what? I said, very maneuverable. So it was a, during the first part of the test program, it was a, um, yeah, we, we, we were pleased with the progress that people had made in the flight control systems that it was a fly-by-wire system and uh, it was very easy to fly it was as long as everything was working correctly. Right, yeah, true. Yeah. When you, thinking back to some of the original test test flights, you got, what, were they done mostly within the cells vertical and hover and then slowly transitioning them yes. to forward? Yeah, our first flights uh, uh, we were probably in helicopter mode for the first you know, 10 hours and after that we got into converting forward you know, we go down to uh, 10 degrees forward 20 degrees 30 degrees uh, so we always calculated that from 90 degrees being vertical that was another debate we had was how do you describe in the cell position. Now we said 90 is vertical. And okay. So we went forward from there and then you go on down to 30, 20, down to zero. But it was a uh, very uh, uh, slow process, you know, just like any test program sure. would be. And uh, 
didn't really discover any big gotchas along the way. All of our, it's not very good to say all, but a lot of our problems were self-induced. You know, really? We lost a helicopter up in Philadelphia, the first one they built in Philadelphia. Now, the original plan was to build half the helicopters of Bell Helicopter here in Fort Worth, Texas, or and then the other half up in Wilmington, Delaware, at the Boeing Vertol plant. And both long-range plan at that time was both companies would uh, fly and develop and share the data back and forth, but then at the end of the development program, the two companies would compete in a, uh, for the contract by bidding against each other to try to get the best product for the military at the lowest price. <clears throat> well. Sounds good, but the expertise uh, was in different places. And the flight control expertise, uh, automatic flight control systems and stuff was a Boeing uh, proprietary stuff. Bell was involved in the rotors, the nacelles, the wing, and a lot of things like that were all Bell helicopter designs and Bell helicopter proprietary information. Fuselage was essentially a Boeing product. Well, there were problems, plus the distance, two sites, communications was a big deal, and that led to the first accident we had when the first flight of the tilt rotor at the Boeing facility in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, information on the latest change didn't get properly transmitted, and some wiring was backwards in the flight control system. And and the pilots took off, they got airborne, and slowly they became out of sync with the gyro feedback into the flight controls. It was out of sync 180 degrees with the pilot's input. No. And slowly they got into an uncontrollable oscillation that they... Actually, I think I've seen that video. Yeah. Is that the one where it kind of tilts back and forth until it gets on the rotor strike yep. and then just kind of balls up? Yeah. Okay. Uh, very sad to see that happen on the first flight of any aircraft. Was it just the two crew members, two pilots? Yeah, right just two people in the in the aircraft. Were they both killed in it? No, neither one of them. Oh, neither yeah. one of them were hurt. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah, which uh, the good thing was that it proved the uh, survivability yeah. for the crew. Uh, and how the rotors came apart, they were basically all, comp the whole airplane was composite. The rotors just shattered like straw, so there were no real projectiles flying into the cockpit or flying into the fuselage. The fuel system survived, it didn't catch on fire. It was a win-win mm -hmm. for us after the accident because it proved that uh, you know, it could survive, people could survive. The safety features worked. Yes, it yeah. worked. Sad to lose a helicopter for a mistake, a human, pure human error mistake, not an engineering uh, design flaw whatsoever. And we, we fought many of those uh, later on in the career of the V-22. We had several design flaws that uh, were easily corrected by re-engineering uh, the airplane, but nothing no design flaws in the uh, concept of tilt rotor. You know, we we had cases where fuel and oil were puddling up because of a leak in a certain area, and that caused a fire. And eventually, the fire uh, consumed the airplane. And unfortunately, they were in the landing mode in Quantico, Virginia, when the leak uh, propagated to a point. We were able to figure out what caused that leak and where the fluid went and, and make those changes. And that was, uh, you know, better engineering. So it caught fire while they were in landing mode? Yes. Were they airborne or on the ground? No, they were airborne. And they, they were coming in for landing. And then when they converted that track fuel and oil, uh, ignited, uh, went into the engine and ignited, and uh, they lost the airplane. And that, that was a uh, terrible thing to happen, losing
losing a lot of good people, good test pilots, uh, good engineers. How many people were lost on that flight? Uh, I would say, I think eight were total. Wow. Yeah, it was very sad to, to lose that many people in one, one accident. I remember watching the development of it somewhat. You know, I was kind of young then, but younger. But anyways, it seemed like every, every time something went wrong, all the people in Congress, whatever, that were against it the whole time just kept on saying, I told you so, we should have chopped it. Yes. And I, I think it's phenomenal how, just like you said, the, the Marine Corps and, and the, the believers in the Marine Corps stood behind the project and saw it through to fruition and how much of a successful project it, it is now. And it, you really have to hand it to people who have a belief and understand technical issues, technical problems, and say, that's not a design flaw with tilt rotor technology. That's an engineering problem. We didn't engineer it right. We're learning now, and we're made to changes. Uh, we went through several operational tests, and we had contractual problems all the time. Money being one of the biggest, biggest problems. The Marines were behind it 100%, but the Marines' checkbook was pretty thin compared to the other services. And what that meant in the Marine Corps was that the other helicopter programs in the Marine Corps, you know, maintaining the CH-46, maintaining the CH-53s, uh, other fixed-wing programs, they had to suffer. They didn't get their fair share for upgrades, uh, spare parts, a lot of things. So it was a real burden on the Marines. The Navy backed out of the program. They they didn't want to buy their aircraft uh, that was in the original contract. So we weren't. It, basically, the Navy said, Marines, if you want it, you pay for it, and that's that's where we were. And uh, but we continued on. Was that in. only a Marine operated? No, the uh, Air Force is also in both. That's right, Air That's Force. Right. Air Force has their own models and they are doing very well. You never hear about them because yeah. they're special operations aircraft. Uh, so they're they're doing very well. And you know, it's got to be a good design if they're using it for special ops. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and uh, God bless them, they, they are good guys. Yeah, they are. They, they have a they have their V-22 tilt rotors and they are well equipped, uh, very, very, they they are the real, the Air Force variants are the Cadillac of the V-22 community yeah. because they have the best uh, uh, ASW, not ASW, but EW systems on board and they have uh, Train following radar, electronic warfare. So that yes, yeah, electronic okay. warfare. And so there, those Air Force variants are designed to go alone and unafraid in any place, mm -hmm. and and really use the tow rotor the way it should be used. I had a good friend of mine who I was in a squadron with, and he became a high level Navy officer, and he was like a sink pack, sink land kind of level four star. Admiral. And he said, we need the tilt rotor because we need to send one aircraft to do a mission, carry enough people or be able to extract enough people to really do the mission without sending up five helicopters, three refuelers, four or five escort airplanes. We need to send one alone and unafraid and appropriately equipped to, to do the mission by himself. And that's what the B-22 is demonstrating that, that it can do. It can fly those long legs, it can uh, fly and nap of the earth and, and do that. So, but, How but many that, legs does it have? I mean, what's, uh, what's the average nautical mile range on it? Well, you know, they can fly five, six hundred mile radius oh, wow. and carry respectable without refueling. So. Which a lot of now can... The V-22, yeah, the Air Force variant can do that because they carry more fuel than the okay. Marine variant did. 
the Marine variant is your Chevy truck, you know, <laughs> workhorse, yeah. or a Ford truck, whatever you yeah. prefer. But it's going to start every day and go do the mission. Now the Air Force variant's a little more sophisticated, more systems, because it has a different, different mission. Now you were instrumental in the development of firing the sidewinders off the Cobra, or something like that. Have they ever thought about doing that with the V-22? Very good question. Uh, problem with the V-22 is that uh, forward firing ordnance is incompatible with the rotor blades. <laughs> really? They oh, come, down, <laughs> come down and get in the way. Okay. And uh, well, I wasn't sure if there was if they ever thought about mounting them underneath or whatever. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have now is that the Marines have the V-22 that can outfly anything other than the Harriers or fixed wing airplanes. You know, the Cobras can't support it because they can't keep up with it. Right. And they can't get to the landing zone or to the zone where the V-22s are going ahead of time. Uh, if you do, then everybody knows you're coming. Sure. So if you want to maintain any sort of element of surprise, you know, it's nice to have your fire support right with you. You don't want your fire support there telling the world that you're coming. So the Cobras can't keep up. So the idea was to put a uh, forward firing weapon or weapons on the V-22. Several projects have, have started, but because of funding constraints and some technical issues with putting a gun on the nose of the V-22, they haven't progressed. Uh, the only weapon on the V-22 is a rear firing machine gun, which is, you know, Vietnam era uh, technology, it's just a... Is it a minigun? Yeah, 50 cal. Okay. But a, a lightweight, a 50 cal or 60 uh, millimeter, but not a, not a real effective weapon. No, sure. no accuracy whatsoever, it's just a, a noise maker. <laughs> And uh, you know it makes people feel good when they see it there, but you know you're you're flying away from the, the threat, and hopefully speed is a virtue. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't want to get in the landing zone, and turn around, and try to shoot from your tail. Like this. Anyway, the, the V-22 has not progressed with a offensive weapon system, and a forward firing gun would be a little bit of what allow you a little bit of offensive kind of weapon, but really for your own defense. You'd never want to fly a V-22 as an offensive attack airplane. It's always for defense. And having the, the gun on the nose would have been a, a better place for it. Now, who is going to fire it? Uh, good question. You know, we talked about some sort of sighting system for the crew chief to, to fire it. But when you're in the V-22 and the, this, you're in airplane mode, those rotors are right outside the fuselage. So a side-mounted gun is is not an option. A side-mounted gun may work pretty well in the helicopter mode, but then you have the big nacelles uh, outside the, the windows also. So geometry-wise, it's a it's a challenge, and sure. it, I think it'll only be solved when no. they come up with some uh, some electronic system of putting the gun on the nose that maybe drops down, and uh, you don't want to put too much weight out there, and you don't want to put too much drag out there for sure. So right now it's it's a pretty much unprotected, but it relies on speed to. Uh, overcome a lot of those problems. When, <clears throat> you know, some airplanes are heavy on the stick, some are light. What was the V-22 like? Oh, it was... Fly-by-wire, I would imagine it would be light, but... Well, the, the, the nice thing about fly-by-wire is that you can ad adjust the gains so that the flying the, the airplane was, was really, really simple. It didn't require large control inputs at all, small control inputs. Think about it, it would have been a great aircraft for a uh, um, 
side stick controller. The airlink was always something that, that we considered. Uh, side stick controller works really, really nice with a glass cockpit because then your glass cockpit displays aren't hidden behind a, a stick. You put the side stick controller off on the side mm -hmm. and it's a fly-by-wire system. You know, then you, you just change so the... So you don't need the leverage of movement? No. Yeah. No, you okay. Don't, you need that at all. And uh, it was just one of those things we never went to. Uh, it was a cost issue. There were a lot of technical uh, risk or there were there could have been some technical risk if it didn't work yeah. and we weren't sure if it would work uh, one of the real problems we had in early design was the collective collective for helicopter people has always been the orientation of pulling up with your left hand would be adding power to the rotors. So for anybody's mind, coordination between your hand, your eye, and your brain, you know, if you pull up, you're going to go up. And it's simple to learn. It's like riding a bicycle. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very simple. But then you consider, okay, V-22 in airplane mode, are you going to be pulling up to go forward, faster forward? Jeez. So we were toying with the orientation of the thrust control lever, we call it, instead of the collective. Was it going to be pure vertical? Was it going to be on an arc? And a lot of, a lot of helicopters today, the Huey, the Cobra, so many of them are on an arc. Mm -hmm. So it's very comfortable to move your arm that way, but it's still backing up is more power. Um, didn't seem right for the V-22. The uh, program manager for the V-22 at that time was a Marine, Colonel Blot, uh, became General Blot, became very, very successful in the Marine Corps. But as a program manager, his aviation background was in the Harrier program. So he said the Harrier pilots had no problem going with a power forward lever a la fixed wing aviation. You go forward with your power lever and that gives you more power and you're going up if your nozzles are in the vertical mode or you're going forward. So it's intuitive. For them, forward meant power, which is a little bit backwards for helicopter guys, right. especially guys who are used to the the old arc. Yeah. Uh, lever that was predominant in the Cobras and the Hueys. So, man, we, we debated that. That went, there were volumes of trees, volumes of uh, documents written, thousands of trees killed for paper to write those things. <laughs> we finally <clears throat> uh, realized that uh, people were making mistakes both ways. The orientation was, was not right in the original. And the original... What was the original setup like? Well, the original setup was uh, kind of kind of up and down, but it was still uh, felt somewhat like a helicopter, but it was uh, it, it didn't feel right to us yeah. after we started flying it. And then those were helicopter guys saying it doesn't oh, feel wow. right to us. So the first models were built just with, with that concept. And then we said, you know, we're trying to pair these two together. Colonel Blood had the right idea. Thrust is forward, whether it's vertical or not. And we kind of changed it a little bit so that the thrust was, was not in, in the pure forward plane. So the second variants of the V-22 were built for the pure forward thrust. Is that centrally located or no, outside? Side. No, no, it's on, on the side. Oh, okay, okay. So it's on your, you know, if you sit in a, a jet 
and put your hands on the controls, you know. Sure. Forward. Okay. Both well, left and right? Yes. Yeah. On the V-22, the PIC flies from which seat? Right seat. Right seat? Yeah. Similar to a helicopter? Yes. Okay. But that has to do with landing on, on ships. Ah, oh, okay. Because ship traffic pattern is a left-hand traffic pattern. You take off from the ship, you fly up, turn left, then when you come in for the approach, which is a key, most critical part of landing on a, on a ship, uh, you approach it from the left side of the ship. So you have to sit on the right-hand side of the helicopter to, to see the ship and see the deck spots and, and the landing. Otherwise, you know, the guy in the left seat, he's trying to fly across the cockpit and he doesn't have a very good view of the of the ship. Okay. You told me, make sure I get this right, you did the original carrier qualifications? Yes, I was lucky enough to do that and I, I did it with a, a friend of mine who was a military uh, pilot and he was still in the Marine Corps and we, in fact he worked for me in HMX, he was one of my pilots in HMX and uh, Bob Price, uh, little Bob Price, there's a big Bob Price who's running around the Marine Corps at the same time. So little Bob Price was just by the school graduate, so it was Big Bob. But anyway, little Bob was on our V-22 program as a military officer. Now, the contractor, you know, certifies the airplane. And we, we did a lot of ground tests for the shipboard environment. And we said, it's ready to go to the ship. But the shipboard qualifications and the shipboard demonstration is a military responsibility. So I was lucky enough to fly with him during all the ground tests and we certified the aircraft. It was ready to go to the ship and then I flew out to the ship with him and he did his first five landings and he was in the right seat, the aircraft commander for that and the contractor pilot myself. I was in the left seat just observing, making sure things went as we predicted they would and went as we demonstrated on the ground, uh, doing uh, field carrier landing practices, same pattern, but just landing on, on, the, on the ground with shipboard markings and stuff and using the directions from the uh, controllers the landing spot controllers that are on board the, the ship. So I flew those five landings with him and he was flawless as usual, great pilot. And I uh, climbed out of the V-22 and turned it over to the military guys and they they continued on that day. They did maybe 25 landings. Uh, oh, wow. Different pilots uh, flying. And had a, a good day. It was, it was yeah, good. Yeah, That's a lot of flying one day. Well, yeah, it, it was good to see that, that day progress. Now, was that a standard carrier or was that a helicopter? Helicopter carrier. Helicopter. LHA. LHA. Okay. Light helicopter amphibious ship crew. Okay. You were, a little while ago, you were telling me about the dimensions that yes. the Navy had as far as now the rotor blades are only safe. If you, if you land it next to the island, you got six feet of clearance. I believe it's six feet of clearance. Uh, roughly. Tip of the rotor blades to the island. And, and that dimension, and the dimension of the, the that's the right-hand rotor to the island, and then the dimension of the left-hand landing gear to the deck edge. Those are designed, you know, the Navy says, thou shall build a aviation vehicle, and those are dimensions you have to stick with it. So no more bigger than that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you can't Six foot of clearance is not that much. No. Not, but uh, that number may not be, from my memory, may not be totally correct, but those dimensions are the ones that... Even if it's 10 feet, they still don't mind. <laughs> you know, yeah. Those it's guys good. are pretty good pilots. So. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. But that takes in night time, weather, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Rolling seas? Yes. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the guys can land within a f you know, six seven inches of their intended landing spots. Wow. Because there's a guy out there directing them 